Good morning. My name is Ron. I'm one of the pastors here. I get to share the word with you today. So if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, that's where we're going to be uh, this morning. Actually going to look at a few scriptures in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, but that's kind of where we're going going to be hanging out. Before uh, I begin to to share the word with you this morning, I want to pray for a couple things. So one is I want to pray for Dan Salia. So many of you, I think, have probably heard. So Dan is at Cottage Hospital down in Santa Barbara. He had a couple of stints put in his carotid arteries here on the side. He's been dealing with cancer for like 10 years, and um, with the radiation and everything, it kind of affected blood flow and stuff. So he was taken down to Cottage um, yesterday, I believe. So we're going to pray for Dan. And then we're also going to pray for, I'm sure you guys probably heard what happened yesterday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A shooter went into a synagogue there and killed 11 people and, and uh, injured a bunch of others. So let's just take a minute to lift up these needs to the Lord. Father, we, don't, we want to pray for our brother Dan. Lord, we, will, we love him so much. We just, he and Kathy being here every week is such a joy. And in the midst of what he's been going through, we've just always seen him with a smile on his face. You've given him peace comfort and and joy in the midst of his trial lord we pray for him right now at cottage hospital that you know whatever he needs would be met lord through the physicians the nurses and through you and that both he and kathy would just sense your presence in a really profound and powerful way where where he's in the hospital they would just sense your loving arms wrapped around them at this time lord we pray that dan would have many many more fruitful years upon this earth and Lord, for the, the people in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Lord, we can't even begin to, to know or feel the pain and the anguish that they're going through having um, endured the shooting. And Lord, we pray for the families of those who were killed, Lord, that you would bring, as you promised you would, comfort in the midst of the trials of life. Uh, Lord, may you wrap your arms around the whole congregation there and that you, uh, just in a sovereign way, that they would sense your love and your, um, your arms reaching out to them as well. And so, Lord, a blessing upon them, peace upon them. Help them, Lord, through this difficult time, we pray. And also, Lord, as we open up the scriptures, Lord, we, we look to you to be our teacher. Holy Spirit, we look to you to really help us see things and understand things and learn things that, that will help us and will help us to be a greater impact in the world in which we live. So, Lord, we commit our time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, if you want a title for this morning's message, the thing that Paul's going to be talking about here. So, this letter, in the letter of Ephesians, was written by the Apostle Paul. Just give a little, little background. So, he spent about three years in Ephesus. He planted the church there. He loved these people dearly. And at the time that he wrote this letter, he was actually in a prison, a Roman prison. He couldn't get to them, and so he wrote this letter, and he's pouring out his heart to them, um, helping them, reminding them of the things that he taught them while he was with them, and just wanting to build them up and encourage them. So the thing that he's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 3, it's the revelation of the mystery of God. So that's what we've been looking at this morning, the revelation of the mystery of God. And so as we look at Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, Paul says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already. So a couple of things. One is, so I'm using the New King James Version this morning. Your version might read a little differently, but hopefully you get the same same message out of it. And, and, And secondly, um, I just want to remind you that, you know, Paul's, he's in prison when he's writing this to them, and he's, he's reminding them about something that he talked about earlier in the beginning of this letter. So where he says there, for this reason, and then in verse 3 he says, you know, I've already briefly written about this, which requires us to kind of go back a little bit and see what was he talking about. What was Paul talking about? So jump back to chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 10, Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. More background. (laughs) The believers in Ephesus were predominantly not Jewish people. All right, so what that means at the time of this writing is there was this huge gap, chasm, 
wall, barrier between the Jewish people and everybody else. So to the Jewish mindset, the Gentile nations were, um, they were ungodly, they were barbarians, they were uh, rejected by God. And so the Gentiles, they felt this. They felt this rejection. To the Jewish mind, they were the chosen ones. And yet Paul's, he's going to be breaking down these barriers. That's part of the mystery that we're going to be looking at this morning. He's breaking down these barriers that existed at the time. So, verse 7, in him, he's talking about Christ Jesus. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. And here's the mystery as it begins to unpack it. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth in him. In Jesus Christ. So it's interesting, Paul uses here this interesting word, verse 10, in the dispensation of the fullness of time. So literally, um, it means that God is sovereignly arranging the affairs of human history to accomplish his eternal plan. I want to say that once more. He's talking about the dispensation of time. Literally means that God is sovereignly arranging the affairs of human history to accomplish his eternal plan. Sometimes we look out at what's going on in the world today and it's, it's like, this is utter chaos. It's craziness. The world is fractured more than maybe ever before. And it's easy to say, Lord, you know, what are you doing? And yet what we see Paul's going to talk about here, God has an eternal plan and he is sovereign and his plan will be accomplished. Now, when we talk about God's sovereign plan, we might think about last night, just last night. For example, when apparently the Lord allowed um, the Dodgers to, to uh, I can't even hardly say it, to lose. Um, how many Dodger fans are among us? Okay, how about in the loft, any there? Okay, I see those hands. How many Red Sox fans do we have among us? A, a couple, okay. How many could care less about baseball? Okay, all right. Did you know the World Series is happening right now? I don't know if anybody... Okay, so... Does God care that the Dodgers lost? <laughs> Remember, God is sovereignly arranging the affairs of human history to accomplish His eternal plan. So, may I suggest to you this morning that God is still in the process of revealing his eternal plan to us. There are more mysteries yet to be revealed. There are more prophecies yet to be fulfilled. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. Look ahead to chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. Ephesians 2, 19. Now therefore, again he's talking to Gentiles here, you are no longer strangers. You're no longer foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's huge. That's Paul's message. Through Christ, through the gospel, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So apparently the kingdom of God is open to Jew, Gentile, every nation, tribe, tongue, ethnic group, people group that has ever lived or will ever live. And what God is doing through this ministry, mystery is basically bringing people to himself. He's, he's, he sent his son to the cross for the relationship to be restored and established that he desires. And so he talks about the fact there again in verse 22 that 
He's being, we're being built together for a dwelling place of God. You know, on one occasion, Jesus talked about, uh, in my Father's house, there's many mansions. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, these big buildings and structures and cities and stuff. In, in my Father's house are many mansions. And, and I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be also. I don't think he's talking so much about buildings and structures. He's talking about God dwelling in us and we dwelling in him. This coming together, and we're going to look at that in just a few moments. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, Do you not know that, that you, your body, that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now jump ahead. This is all background to chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. I'm going to read 1 through 7. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the dispensation, he's talking about it again, the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And here it is. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So this is good news to the non-Jewish people that he's talking to who thought themselves as being rejected by God. And Paul again saying, the Gentiles will be fellow heirs of the same body and they will be partakers of all the promises of God in Christ through the gospel. Paul is, you know, in, in thinking about, imagine Paul, he's saying, listen, I have a revelation that God gave me of some, myst- some mysteries that have been hidden through the ages, and I'm, and I'm going to tell you what they are. I mean, so Paul's trying hard not to boast, even as he tells them that God has revealed some things to him that have been hidden throughout the ages from previous generations. What he's actually going to unpack for them is, all the prophecies of old, the Old Testament, are now coming to fruition. They're finding their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And I, I want to show you that. I want to declare that, to that to you. Um, you guys remember, um, so one of the famous people in pop culture, his name is Yontego, <laughs> what is his name? Yonego Montoya. You remember Yonego Montoya? Okay, if you don't remember, I'll, I'll clue you in a little bit. Yonego Montoya. So he's famous because he's having a sword fight with the, 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 the guy in the black mask. Okay, you, you tracking with me so far? Okay, so Yonego Montoy, he's having his sword fight with the man in black. And it's not Johnny Cash. <laughs> and uh, so they're having this sword fight and they're, they're both using their, their left hands as, in their duel, right? Okay. And Yon, Yonego Montoya says this, he says, I know something you don't know. I know something you don't know. And, and what is it that the man in black didn't know? I'm not That's right. He says, I'm not left-handed. And <laughs> so Paul, back to Paul for a minute. <laughs> He's saying, I know something you don't know. And I want to tell you about it. I want to reveal it to you, the mysteries of God. Verse 3, he says, how that by revelation... Princess Bride, by the way, in case you're wondering. <laughs> How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've briefly already written to you. This revelation, the word there, it's, it's apocalypse. It is an unveiling of truth. It is a disclosure of things that were previously unknown. Paul's saying, I want to I re- reveal these things to you. And again, he says, these things I'm revealing to you, In verse 3, he says they're they're a mystery. Mystery meaning they are secret counsels of God that deal with the human race. Secret counsels of God that deal with the human race. Uh, I think in a way God enjoys keeping things covered in mystery, if you will. Clouded in mystery. There's treasures in the scripture if we're willing to open it up. In fact, uh, when the Lord was speaking to Moses uh, in Deuteronomy 29, he said this. 
The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed, Moses said, the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So Moses said, not everything about God is revealed, but the things that are revealed, they're, they're promises that we can hold on to. God has revealed certain things to the human race, but we see that not everything is revealed at the same time. There are certain mysteries that God is still in the process of revealing, still in the process of unveiling. It's up to us to, to discover those things, and most of those things that are being revealed are, are wrapped up in the gospel, and we're going to talk about that this morning as well. All right, jump ahead. We read it a moment ago in verse 5, chapter 3, verse 5. He says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So Paul is helping us understand this. Peter talked about the very same thing. I'm reading to you from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 10. He says, this salvation, Peter's talking now, this salvation was something that even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the, the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterwards. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preach in the power of the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Now imagine you're Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, one of the prophets, and, and God is communicating something to you, that, and you're, you're writing it down, and you have no idea. It's a mystery. I'm just obeying God. I'm writing it down. Fast forward, Paul's saying, Peter's saying, those things are now being revealed in the gospel. And he says, as he closes out, and it's all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. As Jesus was speaking to his disciples, had them gathered around himself in Luke chapter 10, this is what he said to them. He said, blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it. Jesus speaking, these things are now being revealed. You remember Jesus, when he was on the road to Damascus, he had been put on the cross. He had already died for the sins of the world. He'd been put in a tomb. He'd been raised from the dead, and this is just prior to his ascension into heaven. He's walking with these two guys on the road to to Emmaus. I said Damascus. I meant Emmaus. You Bible scholars probably caught me on that one, right? He's on the road to Emmaus, and these two guys, have, they have no idea who he is, or, and they're just thinking about the things that have happened because they were there when Jesus was crucified. And it says that at beginning at Moses, Luke chapter 24, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. What is the Bible about? From cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back to verse 6 for a moment. Again, this mystery that Paul's unpacking for us, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So here we see God's mysterious eternal plan more fully understood and and revealed by the Apostle Paul. For a moment, I want to jump back to chapter 2 again. We read it a moment ago, Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 18. For through him, through Jesus Christ, we both, the both he's talking about is Jew and non-Jew. We both have access by one Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, to the Father. We see, even see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in that one verse. Through Jesus Christ, we both have access by the Holy Spirit to the Father, verse 19. And now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having access. 
access to God. Again, we're talking about a relationship here. We're not talking about religion. We're not talking about man's way of achieving righteousness. We're talking about God extending His grace throughout the ages, inviting men and women of all races, tribes, tongues, ethnic groups, backgrounds to come to Him, to give us access. Paul talks about that a little more in, in Galatians chapter 3. He said this. He says, In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. But you are all one. You are all one in Christ. So he breaks down not only those ethnic national barriers, but he breaks down the other barriers that sometimes would divide us, whether, you know, Slave or free, so he's taking down economic, you know, divisions as well. Male or female, gender doesn't matter to God. You come to him, and he wants to do what? You are all one in Jesus Christ. So it, it, it um, we're all equal. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. And again, Paul talking about the same thing in Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. He's talking about the blessing of Abraham. Remember, the promise was given to Abraham that through Abraham, through his seed, talking about Jesus Christ, through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, just so you know, in, in our generation, this might not seem so radical, in Paul's generation, this was so radical, that's what put him in prison. Every time he brought up the fact that Jesus Christ died for both Jew and Gentile, Jew and non-Jew, Jew, um, he, he, it led to a fight. Um, so by the way, I got to, what do I do with my coin? Do you have my coin, DJ? I, I need a coin. I need a, any, any coin will do. I thought I had my coin with me. Any, any coin, penny will do. I can't see that, but I think. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. Reminds me of that play in the outfield the other night. I got it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. So i got to give credit where credit is due. I did not know this until the other day when, when Logan Wise shared this truth with me. So on every coin, whether it's a penny, a nickel, a dime, or a quarter that the U.S. Mint prints, there's actually three things on each coin. Um, there's one word and two phrases. Again, it's on every U.S. coin. And the, uh, okay, I'll open up to you guys. What do you think the one word is that's on every coin? Uh, no. The word is liberty. All right. The two phrases are, number one, in God we trust, and the other phrase is e pluribus unum, which means out of many, one. Out of many nations. We're a melting pot. The United States of America. In God we trust, which brings about liberty, which is freedom, therefore, E pluribus unum, out of many, one. Now, to be sure, liberty is not the same as equality. He takes us, and as a nation, we're different. We all have freedom to do as we choose to do. Now, in Christ, we have liberty. Uh, Paul talks about stand fast in the liberty wherein Christ has made you free. So we are free. We're not the same. We're not equal in that sense, but we are all free. We have liberty to obey the Lord and to pursue the things that he has called us to. Again, that term on our coins, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. That's exactly what Paul is talking about here. Bringing together those who, for various reasons, would not normally come together, but in Christ, you are all one. I would encourage us for sure to be praying for the United States of America because I think this is a time where we are probably more divided than, than maybe every, any, any time in our history. That God would bring about what he desires, that we would trust in God, which leads to true liberty so that out of many we can become one in Christ. As I mentioned earlier, Paul, he's trying hard not to boast about these things that are being revealed to him 
things that have been hidden throughout previous ages and generations. So which leads to verse 8. So back in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. He wants to be clear. He says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. So now Paul's, again, he's helping, to, helping us to understand further this mystery. He says, I'm talking about the unsearchable riches that are found in Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon, you guys may recognize that name, famous preacher from a couple hundred years ago. Here's what he said about that. He said, I am bold to tell you that my master's riches of grace are so unsearchable that he delights to forgive and to forget enormous sin. The bigger the sin, the more glory to his grace. If you are overhead and ears in debt, he is rich enough to discharge your liabilities. If you are at the very gates of hell, he is able to pluck you from the jaws of destruction. He's talking about the unsearchable riches that are found in Jesus Christ. Another translation of that same verse, verse 9, the NIV, it says, to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. So there's the fellowship of the mystery. There's the administration of the mystery. What's he talking about? How did Paul administer the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, he tells us right here in verse 8, he says that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That was Paul's calling, Paul's ministry, Paul's message, to go to the Gentile nations and to preach what? Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can discover the unsearchable riches that are found in him. So how did Paul administer this mystery? Through preaching. How do we administer this mystery? Well, again, says Paul says that I would preach the gospel. We're, we are called to preach the gospel, to administer it to others. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I'm certainly no preacher, and, uh, and yet I would say we are all preachers. What do I mean by that? That our lives are giving a message. It might be through words. It might be through our character. It might be through other things. But our lives, the Scripture tells us, we're like living letters, living epistles, being seen and read by all men. So our lives are preaching. Whether we feel like we're a preacher or not, we are administering the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to those around us. In fact, Paul talks on one occasion about it. He says, we are the fragrance of Christ. And so as people come around us and get to know us and, and understand who we are, Hopefully, what they come in contact with is the aroma of Jesus Christ in whom we trust. I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are a preacher. And the sooner we come to understand that, the sooner we realize, okay, I have a responsibility here. This, this mystery, the unsearchable riches in Christ are not just for me. They're meant to be shared, administered to others. So Paul, again, talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, Since God, in his wisdom, saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven and is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those who are called, those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. I heard a testimony yesterday at the men's breakfast, and I could really relate to this part of it because the guy who was given the testimony, which was Dave, David um, um, Roos, thank you. Uh, similar in that, like him, when I first heard the gospel, I didn't know anything about anything. Didn't grow up in a Christian home, didn't know anything about the Bible, was with some other people, and I heard an evangelist preach the gospel, and he gave an invitation. And I thought, well, I have no clue what he's talking about, but I'll do it. 
and I prayed and I invited Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. So Paul talks about you know, the foolishness of preaching. I didn't know anything about anything and yet I chose to, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and I'm going to invite Jesus into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Something began to change in me after that. It took years for sure, but it was the power of God working in me through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand when we, you know, when we administer the gospel, we may see no effect, but know that God is working and the Holy Spirit is working in, in hearts that are open to hear, hearts that are open to him. So back to Ephesians chapter three again, he's talking about, I'm preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ, verse nine, and I'm making all see what is the fellowship of this mystery, which has been you know, hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Wow. The manifold wisdom of God being made known by the church. Who's the church today? He's talking about believers, talking about the body of Christ. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the heavenly realms, to the principalities and powers, to the angelic realm. The manifold wisdom of God. Now, just for you guys to know that I am actually an expert in Greek, um, I want to give you what that word is, the manifold wisdom. It's a Greek word, polupoikilos. Polupoikilos. Something like that. Okay? (laughs) <laughs> and it has the idea of the manifold wisdom of God is this. It is the intricacy. It is the complexity. It is the great beauty of God that is being unfolded through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So think about it. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers So this explains how God will reveal his wisdom and to whom he reveals it. He will reveal reveal it by his work in the church and he will reveal it to angelic beings, principalities and powers. So sometimes we think, you know, angels kind of know everything about everything because they're angels. That's not true. They don't understand the gospel like we understand the gospel. They don't have the Holy Spirit revealing things to them as we do. So the impression is they're looking upon us. And they also are amazed at the power, the unsearchable riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So first, God wants to reveal his great wisdom and glory to the church, to us, to you, and to me. So we see that in the big picture, God does not use angels to reveal his wisdom that's an important thing to remember god does not use angels to reveal his wisdom to the world and to the angelic realm this tells us that we are called for something far greater than our own personal salvation we are called to be the means by which god reveals his amazing grace to the earthly realm and to the heavenly realm i don't begin to understand all that's in that. Another commentator, I'll just read to you, I I can't really pronounce his name, I think it's in Greek also, says, so speaking about the angelic realm, this is what he says, what then have they to learn from us? They have to learn something which makes them watch us with wonder and with awe. They see in us indeed all our weakness and all our sin But they see a nature which, wretched by itself, wrecked by itself, was yet made in the image of their God and our God. And they see God at work upon that wreck to produce results not only wonderful in themselves, but doubly wonderful because of the condition of the human heart. This means that angelic beings, they're interested in And they're instructed by the lives of Christians. This is why the conduct of the church, our conduct, is so important. Because angelic and demonic beings are looking on 
And God's intent is to teach them through us. Again, Peter talked about this also, not just Paul. Peter talked about it. I gave it to you a moment ago. It was 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Peter talks about this. He says, it is all so wonderful. The gospel is so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Back to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul's going to kind of wrap things up here. Again, verse 10. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Paul reminds us of God's eternal purpose, and that purpose is this, to give us bold and confident access to our Heavenly Father, to give us bold and confident access to the Father. The writer of Hebrews talks a little bit about this. Hebrews chapter 4, he says this, since we have a great high priest, and who is our great high priest, by the way? Jesus Christ the Lord. Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Again, Paul talks about it. The writer of Hebrews talks about it. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because we have confident access to the Father to the creator of the heavens and the earth through the Son, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul wants to encourage us to draw near, draw near to the Lord. Have you ever felt like God was against you? I know, I, I, some, I don't know that I've ever felt that, but I've talked to people that I felt, you know, God, God hates me. God's against me. And you know, that's just, so, that's just simply not true. In fact, Paul talks about this in Romans 8, 31. He says, God is for us. If God is for us, is God for you today? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not through him also freely give us all things? God is for you today. You need to be reminded of that. Life's hard, isn't it? I was talking to somebody just the other day and they were just going through this difficult health thing and, and uh, they're like, oh, I, I just don't, I don't understand. I feel like God is, you know, against me and things. I said, listen, you need to know a couple of things. First of all, God never promised that there wouldn't be trials in life. But he did promise that he would be with you in the midst of your trials. Life is hard. That's why, that's why Jesus came to set us free to give us liberty. All right, so I want to kind of bring this to a conclusion now. So here Paul is talking about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul is talking about the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the mystery. The mystery is there is so much. Jesus has accomplished so much for us. God so wants to open it up to us that we can understand to a greater degree, the unsearchable riches that are found in Jesus Christ. So as we get ready to close, I just want to quickly, simply give you the gospel. There possibly might be some people here, you don't know the Lord, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. This is kind of like the gospel I heard years ago, and I just said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. And that's when God really began to reveal some things to me. So here's the gospel, basically, my words. We were lost in sin... God provided the way of escape through his son. Jesus Christ took our sin and died in our place on the cross. And the last thing Jesus said before he died on the cross is this, it is finished. And what that literally means is paid in full. Our debt, our sin debt has been paid in full 
by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. He literally died in our place, and literally our sins were placed upon him by faith on the cross. And after three days, Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to God the Father, and he is preparing a place for us. He's preparing a place for you. So my encouragement, we're going to have communion in just a moment. Before we have communion, just make sure you've given your life to Jesus Christ. When I prayed, I prayed something like this. You can pray along with me if you like. Lord, there's so much I do not know, but Lord, I'm willing to let you in. I feel like you're knocking on the door of my heart, and so, Lord, I'm willing to open the door. So Jesus, if you are the Lord, I invite you to come into my life to be my Lord, to be my Savior. I confess that I have sinned and I I need forgiveness. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you to come in and fill me and teach me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.